Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Michelle is going to open us in prayer. So in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the room, fill our hearts. We love your presence. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for your love, your forgiveness, your grace. We thank you for this beautiful fall day. And I thank you for Kathy for sharing her testimony with us. Let us open our hearts to all the ways you want to speak to us through her testimony. And we give you all the glory. We ask for your blessings on our conversations we have today as we go deeper into your presence. And we ask Mother Mary to surround us as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So just a real quick reminder, we are not meeting next week, next Tuesday. It is election day, so we are not meeting. So don't show up, but vote. <laughs> and if you do, you'll be all by yourself. So um, question? Yes. We have 24-hour adoration, so please do come and pray in front of Jesus. So thank you for that. So we have a wonderful speaker this morning, Katie Connors. Um, she has a very short bio, but she has a very full life. My goodness. Um, so Katie grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Wow. Um, met her husband Brad and began raising her family in Milwaukee. The Holy Spirit led her family to Michigan, and we are so grateful, and eventually OLGC. Brad and Katie have seven children and are grateful for the amazing faith community at OLGC. So let us welcome Katie. Thank you. And just so you guys know, I've been to lots of parishes and there are very few like OLGC. It is incredible and I hope you never take it for granted because there's so much going on here and it's not like this around the country. So we are very, very blessed. Um, I like to talk, so I will try to stay on track. But I um, took my computer to adoration the other night and said, okay, Holy Spirit, you can write my talk because I don't know. I have so many things I can talk about. You tell me what to talk about. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was encouraging me to talk about how God builds a tapestry in our lives and we don't see the finished product. We see the mess. We see the backside of it. And every so often we can flip it over and we're like, oh, oh my gosh. And you can see how God has been weaving in and out and making connections your whole life. And it all comes together. And I feel like God blesses me with those glimpses sometimes. And in those spaces, I feel like those are miracles. And um, but just starting out, I grew up in St. Louis. I have a brother and a sister. My parents had three miscarriages and then three kids in three years. And I'm so grateful that they didn't give up on trying to have children because they easily could have said like, this is too much, this is not working. And one of the blessings of my mom's miscarriages is she found out that she had low progesterone which typically doctors won't give pregnant women progesterone until they've had multiple miscarriages. But because my mom had had miscarriages when I got pregnant the first time, I went to the doctor immediately and said, please test me, we have a history. And I did have low progesterone and they were able to fix the problem before they even knew it was a problem. So I'm so 
grateful for that as well. But so I grew up in St. Louis and we had a very idyllic life. We lived out in the country and went to Catholic school. My mom had grown up Baptist. My dad was Catholic. They met at 19, which was in St. Louis, the religions did not mix much. So being Baptist and Catholic, it really like divided my parents' family a little bit. My dad was one of 12 and uh but they made it work and i'm so grateful for that and um so we were all born and my mom converted to catholicism but she never really grasped it it was more of okay this is what my group of friends is doing so this is what i'm going to do and we were sent to catholic school so we had the catholic religion but on the weekends it was more just like oh okay we're gonna play our sports we're gonna do this we're gonna do that it the faith was not the priority and I always look back at families now I'm like oh I and I try really hard in my own family to create Catholic traditions because I want the kids to have that because it wasn't something that we had um, but when I was in fifth grade my dad was dropping my brother off at a friend's house and I wanted to go with him and he let me go with him all the time and he was like no he was very adamant you're not coming with me I'm going by myself well, I think that was the gift of the Holy Spirit because on that drive, he dropped my brother off and got back in the car and he started having a grand mal seizure. And he sees the person behind him said they could see him seizing for 14 minutes on a windy road with cliffs on both sides out in the country. And it wasn't until he came to the first flat clearing that he slowly crashed the car. And the person behind him was, praise God, somebody from church who knew our family and got out. And this was before cell phones. And so they ran to a house, got the police there, and he was still seizing by the time the police came. So by the time the paramedics got there, he had been seizing for over half an hour, which this type of seizure will kill you typically around 20 to 25 minutes but he survived the seizure they airlifted him because it was rush hour time they airlifted him to the hospital and they got in touch with us and said you need to come now he's not going to make it and so they rushed us in to i don't know if you've been in the situation but there's like a little room in the hospital that they take you and they tell you someone's dying and it's it's horrible i hope you never have to go there so they brought us in there and they said you're you're going to need to say your goodbyes and so being a fifth grader i was like what is going on and so they um, were able to get a second opinion and they discovered he had a giant baseball size aneurysm and that it was going to be inoperable so they said he probably has a week or so so they put him in this suite in the hospital and all of his friends and family came and everyone was like saying their final words goodbyes it was so beautiful <laughs> then we got a third opinion and they flew him down to florida and the doctor there was able to remove his aneurysm um, and he survived and but it was really like he was living on borrowed time he lived an extra 10 years but he was never the same person that he was before they found the aneurysm he liked playing golf he liked drinking with his buddies he was very much like a um, country club man you know and our whole lives changed he had been a car dealer he could no longer sell cars and so but he became my best friend he became a family man and was that he was my coach he was at all my events he was everything to me so in my mind it was great for my poor mom i look back now and i'm like oh she was only 40 when this happened i'm 40 and her whole life changed and um but as for me watching my dad and my family go through the suffering and the pain and the change really i think now from what i've been through recently i think prepared me because i i've seen what that can look like it can be horrible it can be devastating it can be negative it can be depressing or it can have a positive a joyful suffering with joy outlook and my dad went from he had grown up catholic like i said he was over 12 and his mom was my grandmother was very devout she loves ew loved ewtn had it on 24 hours a day and just would pray all the time 
And I would say maybe three of the 12 are still practicing Catholics. But um, when my dad got sick, he realized this world is not all we have. And I need to change my life and focus on Jesus. So he started going to his mother and saying, okay, what do you got? Teach me everything. And so he would go over with her every day and spend time with her. They, he needed a nap, so they would both take their nap together. <laughs> so they would pray their Divine Mercy Chaplet and take their nap. Um, and he just became very faith-filled, and his faith was very childlike because he was like, I don't have the time to become theological. I just want to know that God loves me. And it was through his small actions. He was at church every day, and he just prayed and prayed and prayed. And it was through that that I started to learn okay, there's something different here. Because I had a really, like my grade school, the girls were just mean. I don't know if you had mean girls. But it, I just was like, you know, in my little teenager mindset, I was like, uh, if this is all that we have, then I don't know, like, whatever, God, you suck. Um, so... <laughs> I got to eighth grade and it was time to be confirmed. And I was like, whatever, I don't believe in Jesus. I'm not doing that. And my, at my school, they were like, we don't care if you want to do this or not. This is what you do in eighth grade, which praise God, they say that. So if you have kids that don't want to get confirmed, just do it anyway. Because I feel like those graces of confirmation totally changed me. It gave me such a deeper faith that I, I remember standing there being like, okay whatever and i got that oil and smelled it and i was like oh the smells the sights the sounds i was in the st louis cathedral it's huge it's beautiful it's a basilica it's got all these pictures and mosaics and i was like okay something something okay you know <laughs> i hear you jesus a little bit like i don't want to but i th i get it and then i had my dad over here who was like a daily communicant and then I went to an all-girl Catholic high school, which I loved. It was a fantastic high school, but it was a super liberal high school. We had these nuns who wore street clothes and were very into social justice. They tied themselves to buildings. They, they were just like gung-ho. And on that side of things, it got me super involved in volunteering. I was in the inner city. I was working with homeless people. I loved it. It was great. But they also had a different side of them that they were very pro-women. We were empowered women. We were women who were gonna make a difference. They were the Kamala Harris's of the Catholic faith. And um, it was like very much like, okay, like I get this. They were so, I mean, they were such good speakers and it was very much like, okay, like this is, I, I'm on board with all the, the Catholic stuff, you know, but, um, this whole pro-life thing is still like i mean those poor raped children like we can't let you know um so the whole abortion issue was still kind of like okay well i can be catholic and still like pro-woman and um so i went to the march for life and i just was driving people crazy because they were like oh like chanting their pro-life stuff and i'm like but do you really think and i was over here asking all these questions like on the pro-choice side of things and it really paused people to stop and think like oh i need to figure out how to speak to katie because she's saying all the stuff that the world is saying and um, so I became very good at convincing pro-life people to become more pro-life because I was like, do you actually know what you're talking about? And most didn't. But so it was very interesting how um, I feel like the Holy Spirit gave me that time of being pro-choice and pro-woman because later in my life, I did a thing called Crossroads Walk Across America. And we started in San Francisco and walked up to Toronto to see the Pope and then down to Washington, D.C. And so when I signed up for this, I just, I really like adventures. And so I was like, eh, yeah, I'm pro-choice, but it's fine. I'm going to, I like praying. I like walking. So this sounds like fun. Um, so I had a friend from Steubenville fill out my application. I was like, you fill this out because I don't, you can write all the right stuff so they think I'm pro-life. And he was like, <laughs> okay, Katie, I'll do that for you. And so he filled it out and I got accepted. So I flew out to Washington, D.C. for this march that was going to happen. 
And I came out there and I was like, by the way, um, I think women should have the right to choose. And they're like, oh, and do, what are you here for? And I was like, but um, it was really interesting because they asked me, had I ever seen a video of an abortion? And I said, no, but I can spit off 50 phrases at you. And they said, well, you can be pro-abortion, Katie, if you sit here and watch this video on abortion and these testimonies of women who had an abortion. And once you have done these things, if you still want to be pro-abortion, that's fine. We won't tell you otherwise, like you, but you need to take this moment. So I did, and of course they had, I went to adoration first, and I love adoration by the way. I went to adoration and then I watched these videos and I was blown away. And I felt lied to, and I was just so upset, but it was really a movement of the spirit in my heart and it helped me become very pro-life in a way that I felt like I could then reach out to women who were in the situation that I was in before. And I was I became a sidewalk counselor and I would talk with women and I, I looked like these women. I was their age and I could speak their language. And it was very much like the Holy Spirit had led me to that point so that I could save these babies lives. And we went to San Francisco and we were walking across the Golden Gate Bridge in our little pro-life shirts and we got pulled over by the police and they made us get off the bridge because they said we were being political on the bridge and that was illegal. Well, then this led to a bigger thing. It became a huge news media, like national thing and they needed someone to go on Hannity and Combs to talk about it. I had no idea what Hannity and Combs was. And so I was like, I'll go. And so I got to go to the studio in LA and I was like, I was sitting with them and I was having this conversation and it was just, I felt so confident in being pro-life and being able to speak with these um, people on TV. And my grandmother was watching it in St. Louis and she called my parents and was like, do you know that your daughter is on national television talking about being pro-life? And, um, but on that trip, I feel like another way that the Holy Spirit led me there was I learned how to pray in a more vibrant way, a deeper way. And there was a priest with us, his name was Father Flynn. And he said, you just need to tell God what you want. Like give it to God and just lay it all out there. God has a plan for you and it's not gonna be what you want all the time, but just tell God, he already knows, so it'll make you feel better. It's like when the kid tells you when they want a cookie, they can tell you 50 times, you're never gonna give them a cookie, but you know, it makes them feel better. So I um, learned how to pray in this way where I would speak and I would ask God and I would lay out my desires and I would ask the Holy Spirit to come and be with me. And if it wasn't the way I wanted it to look, that God would transform my heart and make it where I needed to be. And um, one of the times, I, my um, kids think this is really funny, so I'll tell this story. We were walking, we were in the Rocky Mountains, and I was tired, I was sick of walking. It had been many, many days of walking. So the way the walk worked was there were 12 of us, and we had one rosary. And we started on one side of the country, finished on the end with the rosary. And two people would walk at a time, about two to five miles, and there was somebody waiting. And then when you finished like five miles or so, the people waiting would say, do you want to keep going or do you want to break? And you could either keep going or take a break. And it was the 12 of us just kept rotating throughout all day and night. I would walk at night because I burn. But, and then when you weren't walking, you were praying at abortion clinics, you were speaking at churches, you were talking with youth. And so you were always doing something. And, but this time we were walking and I was sick of walking and I just wanted to go home. And I said, I don't think this is what God meant for me to, to be doing with my life. And father laughed at me. He's like, this is exactly what God meant for you to be doing right now with your life, Katie. God is changing you, transforming you and preparing you. And I said, I just want a bagel. 
And he's like, well, tell God about the bagel. And I was like, I'm not telling God about my bagel because that's ridiculous. God doesn't care about me, my bagel. And he's like, no, Katie, in detail, give God your best detail your bagel. And I was like, I want a Panera bagel, an Asiago cheese bagel. He's like, well, do you want it toasted? I go, no, I don't want it toasted. <laughs> And I said, and I want that free cream cheese with it. Well, we get back to, well, we get picked up from our car and we get back to where um, the RV is set up. And um, I don't know if you know this about Panera, but when they close out the end of the night, they give all their baked goods to organizations. Well, I guess this group of sisters had picked up a box of bagels at Panera. So they pull up in their cute little car and they pop out and they're adorable and they're like, hi we're so glad you're here and I'm still like in my bad mood because all I want is my bagel and I'm like see father I'm not getting my bagel you know because we keep because we were living on God's prov I guess I should say that we were living on God's providence and so you couldn't just go buy something because we had no money so everything that we had was provided for us and so I was kind of being snippy and so then the sweetest little novice pops out with this big box and it says like Panera on it and I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> maybe I should stop being such a brat. Um, and she's like, I have bagels here. And father looks and he goes, is there an Asiago cheese bagel in there? And she goes, oh, yes, yes. And she goes, sorry, it's not toasted, father. And he goes, <laughs> he goes oh, no, we don't want it toasted. And then, and then before I could even ask for my fat-free cream cheese, she said, um, and here's a little container of the fat-free cream cheese. Would you like that? And he said, we would love that. <laughs> and I just started crying. I was like, okay, Jesus, I hear you, you know. And But it was in that moment that I realized, okay, like God is here. And I'm so stupid that God needs to be so bam in your face, miracle-wise, that like that was a little miracle in my life. And we, so then I um, go back to my life and I, a couple years later, I go on catholicmatch.com and look for a husband because that's a good, great place to find a husband. My mom and I bought, my mom and bought my sister and I each a one month membership to find our husbands. Mm -hmm. we, we both found our husbands. And my husband, on the other hand, he had bought a one year membership. He had no faith. <laughs> but I found this, I was sitting in my house with these girlfriends and we were all like looking online and we were like calling out, I call him, I call him, I call him. And I found Brad and I was like, oh my gosh, no one, no one message him. He's mine. And they were like, okay. They're like, he looks kind of sick. And I was like reading his thing. <laughs> And, and you guys, he had stage four colon cancer. Like, why are you picking that guy? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. I, he's probably got a story. So I, I messaged him and I sent him, like, I think it was like a smiley face or like, like hey, you know, he sent me back like a 12 page message. <laughs> And he had just finished chemo that day. So he was like through the roof, high on life because he had survived chemo. And, um, but I guess I should go back a little bit. A couple months prior, I had been living in Germany and I went on a pilgrimage to Our Lady of Lourdes. And when I was at Lourdes, I couldn't find anyone to talk to. And as you can tell, I like to talk. And um, I went to confession and there was a bishop there who had brought like thousands of pilgrims. And he said, Katie, if God wanted you to talk, he would have given you someone to talk to because there are thousands of people speaking English here and God doesn't want you talking. God wants you praying. He's like, you are at Lourdes, so clearly you're supposed to be praying. And I was like, okay, I guess I can pray. Um, he's like, no, you don't need to pray. You need to pray. And I was like, okay. I was like, what am I praying about? And he's like, what do you want to pray about? And I said, you know, I feel like God is calling me to be married one day. He goes, okay, you need to pray for your husband. And I said, okay. So I 
pray like more than I'd ever prayed before, like very fervently praying. And I did all the things at Lord's. It was incredible. And I was like, okay, Lord, like take these prayers. They are yours. I do with them what you will. And at that time in Wisconsin, we found out a couple years after we were married, the same weekend, Brad was dying in his organs were all shutting down and he was in a bubble because he was like everything was infecting him so he was in this little bubble and he was dying and they were basically he had per been pronounced terminal they said there's not much more we can do and the weekend that i was in lords praying for him who i didn't know at that time he had a miraculous turnaround and they have no idea why and it like three years after we were married, he was telling me about this miraculous turnaround he had. And I was like, well, I was in Lord's praying for you and I didn't know you. So I, I want you to know that your prayers might work in a way you don't realize. So every time you pray, God is taking those prayers and doing something. And it's not always that you get to see the effects of your prayers like I have. But God takes your prayers and he appreciates it. Even if it's, if you wake up and you're like, oh, I just can't today. Tell God, God, I can't today. Or when your baby's crying and you're like, oh, could you just stop? <laughs> because I have a lot of babies who cry. <laughs> it's, you take that time and you just give it to God. And in, in all of our sufferings and all of our joys, if we can give it to God, God can make a great peace with it and he puts it together and we like I said when you look at that tapestry you don't see it now but one day you will and you'll be like oh when I was praying in church after mass when I didn't want to stay longer God was doing something with that and I feel like God really has shown me those little miracles along the way so that when I had big problems, I was able to recognize, okay, I've had these little things, so now as bigger things are coming, I, I know the plan. The plan is I trust in God. I ask the saints, I turn to God, and I give it to God. Well, we moved from Wisconsin to Michigan, and it was just crazy. We moved in the middle of COVID, and I felt like, oh my gosh, like why is God putting us here? Uh, we had the perfect little life in Wisconsin. We were a, a block from the school, the church, and we loved it there. Um, but I feel like God picked us up and put us in Michigan because um, two years after we were living here, I got pregnant with our seventh baby. And I guess I should go back to my very beginning. I was born with a heart condition. I had a unicuspid aortic valve, and they'd always told me, oh, it's not a big deal. In your 70s, you'll get that replaced. And I was like, okay. So with all my pregnancies, um, I had a cardiology team and, a met and an OB team, and I had preeclampsia with the first six babies. And they said after the sixth one, they're like, you know what, your heart really can't take any more babies, so you need to stop having babies. And we're putting you on this medication to fix your heart, to like slow things down. And that will cause severe birth defects in a child. So do not get pregnant. And they wanted me to get my tubes tied. They wanted me to go on birth control. And I was like, no, I've got this. I do Marquette method. And they're like, okay, um, well, we did seven years of perfect Marquette method. And then one month, <laughs> we did not do so perfect in our NFPing. <laughs> and, um, but you know what? I laugh now because I'm like, it was definitely the Holy Spirit encouraging us to make that baby because the doctors said, so I, I got pregnant with Teddy and I went in and um, they, I saw first Dr. Fleming. I don't know if many of you know Dr. Fleming, but he is amazing. And I went to see him to confirm the pregnancy to get my progesterone. And he told me, he's like, you know, Katie, you're gonna have to go to Michigan for your heart. And in my mind, I was thinking, I, like, yeah, I have a heart problem, but it's not a big deal. Um, and he's like, ah, I think it might be a bigger deal than you think it is. I was like, mm, I don't know. He's like, well, you're going into the lion's den and they are going to want to abort your child. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about because this is like not how my path of pregnancies has gone. And so I go to the cardiology team, they look at my heart and they came in and they told me that um, I probably had a week or two to live. 
And I was like, I am totally fine. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and they said, had I, first of all, had I not gotten pregnant, I would have died within a week or two because I had no idea how sick I was. And I thought I was just kind of like fat and out of shape and tired because I had so many kids. But my valve was 98% closed and I was in severe heart failure. And so apparently all like my trouble breathing <laughs> was because my heart wasn't pumping. And um, so they said I needed to abort Teddy and have heart surgery within the next like one to two weeks. So, but they called it a termination. They said, we'll just terminate they will terminate the embryo and because he wasn't even a, they didn't even want to call him a fetus yet like, we'll terminate him now and then you can have surgery in two weeks and i was sitting there like <laughs> i'm by myself by the way in this office because i was just expecting to have a normal like oh your echo says that you're in moderate you know um and i said no <laughs> that's not happening and they said oh maybe you don't understand and so they brought other doctors in and they were saying listen you have six kids at home they your family needs you this baby is our this fetus this pregnancy is early it's I think I was maybe seven weeks but I had seen the heartbeat so I like I knew it was a viable pregnancy and I said no and so they brought in more doctors and they're like, maybe you aren't understanding. So this was like hours of multiple doctors coming in and I can't get in touch with Brad. And I'm like, <laughs> so I keep saying no. And finally I said, listen, the plan here is we are going to make this pregnancy work. We are going to get this baby as far as we can. If I'm going to die, then we are going to do this together, okay? We are gonna get this baby as far as we can. And if you need to terminate the pregnancy because I'm going to die tomorrow or right now, then we will come to that solution. But right now we are going to see how far can medical technology take us? And they're just kind of looking at me like, why? But your life, and I, I understand my life is on the line. And I have faith that you guys have the skills and the knowledge and technology to help me. And they're like, well, right? And so they all left and I was sitting there and I'm like, oh my gosh, like what is going on? And they come back in and they, there were like six of them and they said, Katie, we wanna introduce you to your team. And since you are choosing to keep this baby, we're gonna do everything we can to get you safely delivered, heart fixed and alive. I said, thanks, you could have done this seven hours ago. <laughs> and so then they said, come back next week and bring your husband and we're gonna go over like details of what this is going to look like. And while you leave us, please don't go walking cross country meets <laughs> and like pay attention to how you're feeling and if you feel anything you need to come right away because you are a ticking time bomb and so i went home and the next week i brought brad back and they told him once again they took him aside and they <laughs> told him listen i don't think she understands what we're saying she needs to terminate the pregnancy and so Brad's favorite thing to say is he's like, so what you're saying is you want me to get my woman in line? <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 that's not what we're saying. <laughs> and he said, well, we, we prayed and we've decided that we are gonna see how this progresses. We will, we will go take this day by day. And so I, I got to go home and I figured since I was probably going to be dying sometime soon anyway, I was gonna be enjoying and doing everything I possibly could with my kids and my family. So my sister and I took a trip to Texas. We had the best time ever. <laughs> and um, I, got, I was doing everything at the kids' school. I actually was at the All Saints Festival with Elizabeth Mooney and I kind of stopped and I felt this gush of blood. <laughs> and she was like, you okay? <laughs> It's like mm, maybe um, and I went and I finished out the All Saints Festival because I figured if I'm bleeding already I mean what are they gonna do there's nothing they can do so I figured I might as well let the kids be happy and be there for them and so then I went to the hospital and I found out that I had a hematoma which also complicates a pregnancy so I had this hematoma I got this heart condition and um, 
I keep living my life to the fullest. I take my daughter shopping all day and I come home and my legs are like three times the size of what they're supposed to be. And my younger daughter says to me, mom, the doctor said if, if you see something unusual like that, you should probably go in. And I was like, nah, it's fine. She's like, no, mom, you need to call the doctor. And I was like, okay, Lily, I'll call the doctor. She'll probably be a doctor one day. Anyway, I go in and they were like, okay, you're done. Like You're clearly not following like restrictions at home. So we're putting you in the hospital. And I was 14 weeks pregnant at this point. It was November. And I was, so I said, okay, this is, this is fine. Like, how long am I going to be here <laughs> like, until you deliver the baby? And I was like, okay. Um, so I, they wanted to send me over to the hospital right away. And I said, well, I can't. It's my daughter's birthday. I need to go home and like celebrate her. So as a logical person, they said, okay, but don't, don't do anything that's gonna cause you to die. I said, okay, <laughs> sounds good. So I go home, I grab some Chinese food and I go to Target and I was messaging my Lyft group. I went, look at this cute underwear. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, what are you doing at Target? <laughs> Go home. Anyway, so I, I stocked up at Target, got all the stuff that I was like, oh, I, I need this for the hospital. The one thing that I did not bring with me to the hospital was a rosary. And as I was sitting in my hospital room for the second day, I was like, oh, gosh, you know, I, I'm going to be in here a long time. I should probably, like, give make this a place that I can pray. And But I'd like a rosary. Um, one of my cardiologists walked in and she says, Katie, I'm not Catholic, and, but I know you are, and I know you have a deep faith. My brother had this rosary. He's passed, and he had this rosary, and I never knew what to do with it, and I felt like God was telling me to give it to you. And on the rosary was a JP2 cross, who I just love, John Paul II, and it was Our, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I have a deep devotion to Our Lady Guadalupe also. And so I was like, oh my gosh, okay, Lord, like, thank you. Like, and I knew I was in the right place. Um, but my time in the hospital, so I was there for a very long time. They had me on the cardiology side and the cardiology nurses did not like the fact that I was pregnant. And they did not like the fact that I was bleeding all the time. So they would call the OB side and say, she's bleeding again. And the OBs would say, we know. And so they, the cardiology people wanted me on the OB side. The OB side said, no, she's a ticking time bomb. We don't want her to die over here. You keep her there. And so every day I had teams of doctors come in, teams of medical students. I had this really cool murmur. So I think probably every medical student at U of M had came through to listen to my heart murmur, and I, I loved it. I was there for it. I was like, okay, who else wants to hear? Um, but in my room, I sat and I prayed, and I wasn't allowed to walk because walking makes like your heart pump, and my heart was not functioning well, so they said I could walk. I got 15 minutes twice a day, and that I could walk. So I, I went from my chair to my bed, to my chair, to my bed. And so I had intentions all over my windows. I had prayers everywhere. And so they started, the people at the hospital started calling my room, the, my monastery. And they were like, if you need a prayer, go find that woman on 7C <laughs> because she's praying a lot. And so people would come to me at the hospital and ask me to pray for them. And I, and I was, I was there for it. And I was like, okay, I've got this. And so I feel like God used me in the, that moment of suffering and trials to pray. And I feel like my time in the hospital there with the doctors, every day they would come and they say, you know, this, this could be it. Like, this is it, Katie. And they kept trying to kill Teddy. And I was like, listen, we found out it was a boy. We named him Teddy so that when doctors would come in and talk about the fetus, I would say, oh, I'm sorry. His name, it's a little boy. His name is actually Teddy. There's two of us. And, um, but the name Teddy would kind of give people a smile, like, oh, that's kind of cute, you know? And so it, it lightened the mood. But so by the time I got to 20 weeks, they were like coming in and, and one of the doctors said, this is Katie, she's pregnant, the baby's name is Teddy. And I was like, oh, yes, like I, I am like transforming science here. <laughs> and, um, but it was, 
every day people coming in and just telling me like, okay, this, this could be it. This could be it. You know, this could be so much easier. You could have eliminated this pregnancy. You could have had heart surgery. We don't know if you're going to make it through this. So it finally came time. Um, they wanted to get us to Valentine's Day, which I thought was really cute since I was a heart patient that it was going to be a heart baby. And January 26th, they said, okay, you, you're you done. Like, we're not doing this anymore. And Teddy was um, 25 weeks pregnant. I was 25 weeks. And, but Dr. Fleming, in his great wisdom, had given us an extra week on our dating ultrasound. So in the hospital's eyes, he was 26 weeks. But in from date of conception, he was still 25 weeks. Um, so they said you, he needs to be born, so he'll be born tomorrow morning. And he'll be born at, I think, 8 a.m. There's a, there's a mom with twins before you, and then he'll be born. I was like, okay. So they came in the morning, and they said that the mom was having complications with the twins, so it's going to be pushed back. So I my whole time of preparing, I was praying for that mom and her twins. And Brad's like, you want to say some prayers for you too? <laughs> I was like, no, that mom needs us. Um, but when I woke up after my C-section, I said, how are the twins? And the doctor goes, you just had one. <laughs> I go, no, not my baby, the babies. And they're like, well, we can't tell you anything, but they're fine. <laughs> but um, but I had this C-section, and they had to put me completely under. And I had two teams of cardiology, an interventional team, an open heart team, an OB team. And there were probably like 45 people in the room. And um, they each have to say who they are and why they're there. And I was like, oh, this is going on and on and on. <laughs> but um, I'm so glad that they were all there because they, they thought that when I gave birth that the blood loss would stop my heart and that they would have to resuscitate me and go into open heart surgery. That was like their figuring that was what was going to happen and luckily that did not happen but I did hemorrhage and lose a lot of blood and so they had to give me a transfusion and they I was so grateful that I was completely out because they would have had to knock me out anyway um, but they took Teddy and he was um, very small and they took him immediately to what they call the nest and they put the baby like in a little bag and father anthony was waiting there and he blessed him immediately and did a baptism and everything seemed to be fine like he was tiny he was small but he was like kicking he was healthy it wasn't until that night that he coded he just completely stopped breathing and they, Brad, I wasn't there. I was recovering in the ICU across the hospital. But Brad said it was just so terrifying because the whole room stopped and then there were hundreds of people in the room. Like it just felt like the whole room had people in it. And they resuscitated and brought him back. And they were trying to figure out why did he stop breathing? Um, and there happened to be a doctor who was like walking the halls. He was almost retired and didn't need to be there but he was there and he came in he's like oh, I, I he liked complicated situations so he walked in it was like it looks like a complicated situation what's going on and so they told him they don't know why this happened and this doctor said well you know i remember reading about this in medical school and i'm pretty sure that um, his pericardium of his heart has been flooded with the blood that you put through the umbilical cord which never happens ever and these doctors like uh okay he, so this um, doctor was able to take a um, an IV, go through his Teddy's little veins, and pull the blood out of the pericardium of his heart and save his life. And had that doctor not been there, I mean, he would have died. They they had no idea how. It was very unusual that this doctor was there, and they're like, it's very much a miracle that he survived and is alive. But while all of that was happening, Brad was sitting in the back of the room and he said he he couldn't find a rosary so he was just using his fingers and praying and praying and praying and this woman came up next to him and I call her his guardian angel in pink pants real cute young nurse in pink pants and she had a rosary and she said um can I help you 
And he's like, I, I, she goes, I want to pray with you. And he said, yes, yes. So, so she was helping him say the rosary because he was so distraught. And then uh, my sister showed up and she walked away. And he, all, he kept saying like, my guardian angel in pink pants like she she was there and it turns out that it was actually a nurse who was a brand new nurse from OLGC who it was her first day on the job so she didn't have a baby yet and so when this was all going on she had heard about our family and so she knew like I guess when oh when NICU families go they let the nurses there know so anyway, so she had come in and she saw Brad and she was helping him. And so she found me later and I was like, well, I like to think of you as Brad's guardian angel in pink pants. <laughs> um, but Teddy had a very strong fight in the NICU and he um, did really well. We got, I guess, six weeks into his NICU stay and the doctors were like, okay, Katie, time for you. And I got to go have my open heart surgery and my family all flew in and they were all very helpful. Um, and it was really traumatic because basically I was saying goodbye to my kids because the doctors were saying like, listen, we're doing this procedure and there's, there's a very strong chance like your, your heart has been destroyed from this pregnancy. Like you have destroyed it. You should not have done this. So the chances of making it through this heart surgery are are slim. And so you need to be prepared that you made this choice. And I was like, I, I, I did, I fully agree. Um, but uh, so Brad brought each of the kids and I got to have a special one-on-one -on -one date with each of them. And I wrote them each letters in case I did die, um, which, I, oh gosh, if writing a letter as if you're dead, oh, I hope none of you have to do it. It's horrible. Um, but each of the kids now, I, I ask them, I'm like, so how did that feel like w when you came to the hospital? And each of them was like, oh, mom, it was the best time ever. <laughs> and so each one of them, they had the best time because I had balloons and I had takeout and, and they each got to like snuggle with me and just have that one-on-one -on -one time. And so I, I, give, I thank God for that moment for them because in a time that could have been very scary for them, they were filled with hope and joy and they were just happy and I credit it with the community everyone at the kids school was always helping them and loving them and in a time that they could have been very depressed and sad and worried they were living their best lives and happy and fulfilled and the day of my surgery I was so grateful because it was a first Friday. So at the kids' school, they do adoration. And Sister Maria Faustina told all the kids, you know, today's your mom's surgery. She's going to be in there a very long time. Um, but I want you to know if you get sad or scared, you can go to Jesus anytime. So you just tell your, you just raise your hand and you just go straight to Jesus. And each of them did. At some point during that day, they went down and they sat with Jesus and they just said, Jesus, I give you my mom. And I'm so grateful that they are being raised at a place that they know the power of prayer, that they know adoration, they know Jesus, and that despite anything in their lives, when it gets bad, they know that they can turn to Jesus. And it is just so miraculous. And the, to me, it, it's so neat that the kids at the school too were praying for Teddy and they each feel like Teddy is their own. I mean, he goes to school now and they're like, Teddy, Teddy. And it was so beautiful to see because you don't often see the fruit of your prayers. And these kids saw a miracle happen. They prayed for this baby and they saw him be born and they have seen him succeed. And um, so, yeah. I think sometimes we do feel like our lives are tangled and that we don't understand why God has us this happen or that happen. And then you look back and you're like, oh, now I see it. So, amen. <laughs>